Um, well, um, yeah, I'm, I feel like a bit of an interloper tonight because I haven't got a uh, haven't got a book. <laughs> so uh, maybe maybe one day I, I will do one. I'll come back. Um, but um, yeah, I have a, a small architecture office in in London, um, and our focus is. Um, so not so much on style, following styles or trends, but it's about kind of trying to stimulate um, a different way for people to experience uh, architecture and design. Um, and I'm going to sort of um, take you through uh, from the stone axe uh, to, uh, so from 700,000 uh, years ago, all the way to the Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki, and hopefully kind of connect these two things uh, um, uh, and explain what I do and why I do it. Um, so the Japanese um, uh, designer and philosopher Ken Yohara, um, who some of you may know, has coined the term senseware. Um, and it's this, this sort of um, kind of bringing together the kind of swear from software hardware and, and the senses as a way of um, describing, he says, um, any familiar matter which inspires our sensory perception. So he kind of asks us to to, um, let's all imagine that we've gone to the British Museum and raided their, their cupboards, and I've distributed these stone hand tools to everyone, um, and we're holding it in our hands, and um, we can feel its texture and its weight, its hardness, uh, the sharpness of the edges. Uh, and you can imagine, actually, the, uh, the thrill of just pounding something with it, uh, smashing something, uh, so this is a kind of object which really uh, evokes a sensory uh, reaction in us. Uh, we understand it inherently. Uh, and at the same time, um, maybe it's because you know, we've been using these as, as, a, as human beings or some form of hominid for a, a million years. So um, uh, maybe Richard can probably... I'm a, it may be a controversial thing to say, but <laughs> Richard can probably tell us more about it. Um, so... Um, this object gives us a, a creative impulse, and I'm, I'm very excited by the idea that, um, that something can hold that sort of um, uh, quality. So Ken Yohara also did a, a very nice project I want to show you uh, quickly, which is uh, the opening program for the Nagano Olympics uh, in Japan. And um, on the left is the program, and on the right is the kind of beautiful, crisp Nagano snow, and he describes uh, as follows. You worked your way forward step by step on the newly fallen cotton ball snow. Your footprints showed through to the dark soil beneath this, this soft translucent ice. Behind, you left dotted footprints. For anyone touching this paper on the left, this is a memory that is involved and enmeshed with images in his mind. The paper of snow and ice, he calls it, is a trigger. This contrivance is design. So it's, it's a paper which he designed, it's puffy paper, which when it was debossed with um, uh, these letters of the program, took, took on the kind of feeling of ice. And when, when, when reading this program, you somehow, uh, you can sense this, um, uh, the, all of what the Olympics, and well, all of what Nagano is about. And so this project is something which I did uh, uh, soon after graduating for the, uh, at the Design Museum in London. And uh, it's a chair, um, the project's called Harvest, um, but they're also bushes in some way. Uh, and if you can imagine, on the one on the left is quite prickly to sit on. Um, and I, I'm kind of curious about what point uh, the bush ends and the chair begins. Um, is, is this both a chair and a bush? So I, I, like the, I like the sort of idea that design can provoke a very natural reaction uh, in the observer. And as, as individuals uh, and societies, we're really finely tuned to identify a character um, and, 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 and to kind of understand the signals given by very simple cues. So um, if you picked up the, the Guardian today, you kind of notice the front cover is um, an emoji, because emoji's just been sort of recognized by the OED as um, the most important word of the year. Um, I got there first. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, so today, with tele te telecommunications, we kind of use the symbol of the human face as the kind of most, uh, in a way, this is the most concise way of communicating our emotions to each other. And my mum is constantly sending me uh, funny, funny 
emojis, which I don't really understand because I'm not up to date <laughs> <laughs> enough. But, um, so, um, uh, take you one step forward, and it's not, it's not a, a particularly uh, new idea. Human emotions have been conveyed uh, by our faces, by artists uh, and, and sort of cave painters for, 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 for millennia. Um, there's something about scale, though, which, which creates a different effect. And maybe it's something to do with um, w when you're a baby and you're looking up at this face of your um, fantastic dad, which I, I like to think I am, <laughs> and um, there's some sense of, of awe and uh, you kind of worship this enormous, uh, this enormous face beaming down on you. So there's a kind of aspect of, of, kind of hero heroism which can be imparted by, by scale. Um, and the play of light on a surface and so on. So um, I was asked to do a project to the Winter Olympics uh, in Sochi, um, which uh, was for a telecommunications company. So their kind of, um, say, product was a platform to send those emojis back and forth. Um, and I wondered what, happened, what would happen if we, if we connected this sort of um, uh, possibility offered by large-scale sculpture with the immediacy of, of the, the emoticon. So, so I kind of devised a, uh, a building whose facade was comprised of 11,000 moving pins. And if, if you remember those um, ubiquitous executive toy, uh, which was uh, the pins, you can't put it down, the kind of pins and you put them on your face and on any object, on corners of things. And it's just <laughs> so I sort of imagined that as a building and the difference being that each of these was a pixel and it could move two and a half meters in and out. Uh, and, um, and also had the ability to, to, to change color and emit light. Um, and people entering this building at Sochi would be 3D scanned and their faces would be um, displayed back to them uh, as they left the building. This is the first test. <laughs> That's... Uh, Happiest client ever. <laughs> so they, they, were, they were so sort of uh, taken a, a, I mean, aback by this that we actually managed to pull it off um, that uh, they said, well, let's just make it full color because it will be amazing. You'll really recognize, uh, you really recognize the people's faces even more. <laughs> or actually, it's extremely scary to see the face of this wonderful uh, Swiss engineer, Mathis Meyer, but at the scale of uh, larger than the Statue of Liberty's face, um, looming over the Swiss countryside. So, um, <laughs> and this kind of fight or flight response was, was kind of felt by everyone. It's basically like a giant appearing in the night. In the night. <laughs> so we didn't do that. Um, <laughs> we, we did this. And um, you know, what, was, what was important um, uh, for me about this project, project was that we, uh, individuals had this kind of moment of, um, say, seeing themselves depicted as large-scale sculptures, seeing yourself, it was almost an out-of-body experience, quite unusual. Um, but at the same time, we managed to show 200,000 faces during the Olympics, so 200,000 people visited the building. And we sent 3D scanners, which we had designed around, so it's kind of like a photo booth uh, with plenty of cameras inside it, around Russia, 12 cities. So, even people who didn't go to the Olympics were able to have some sort of telepresence in the Olympics. And the video of them appearing at the Olympics was shown, was sent to them uh, as SMS message. So this idea of turning the kind of average visitor into a hero for a moment who can kind of, in, almost at the same level of, as the, the athletes, um, um, whether they were, 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 were doped or not, <laughs> uh, not for me to say, uh, it, it was, a, I guess, a very exciting experience for people. Um, okay, now, at, at the other scale, I see this as a kind of sister project to the, to the one in Sochi. This is, um, we were asked to do a pavilion, to make a pavilion for the, uh, the, the Milan Expo, which is a world expo, which is on at the moment in Milan. Um, and uh, the theme of the expo is um, food, oh God, I keep forgetting, it's such a long-winded, as, as all expo themes are. Uh, it's... Um, It's, here you go, feeding the planet energy for life. Now, feeding the planet energy for life basically means how the hell are we going to feed 7.2 billion people 
Uh, and most, most of the countries attending the, attending the expo did sort of growing projects, uh, vertical gardens and this kind of, sort of hydroponics and so on. Um, but I was sort of um, always taken aback by these sort of statistics that you see um, in magazines about food production and global population, and actually you never really understand the magnitude of the problem. And if we could get people to understand it, maybe they'd act on a kind of individual basis. So to cut this long story short, this is our expo plot, 80, by, 80 meters by 12 meters by 15 meters, quite a large uh, space. And I worked out we could fit the entire world's population into that space as long as they were uh, this high. <laughs> so this is, this, is like the, this is the proposal. So we proposed a building with 7.2 billion, uh, one to 100 scale figures of people. Um, and everyone going to the building would be 3D scanned. They'd be given, that's actually me, as a 1 to 100 scale figurine wearing an orange jacket. You'd be given yourself as a figurine. And you would, um, on, on visiting the, the pavilion, place yourself amongst the 7.2 billion. So as a kind of pledge, um, as, an under, as a point of understanding of the magnitude of the task uh, that we all have to face, um, so I, I like the idea of, you know, just by using scale, in, in the case of Megaface, it's, it's sort of um, scale upwards, and here it's about kind of um, magnitude of, of um, quantity, but if we engage our senses in something, it becomes a lot easier to understand, and, you know, if you could imagine um, from the outside, all of that light is passing through 7.2 billion miniature figurines, it somehow tingles your, your nerves to think about it. Okay, so um, kind of going a bit more into, into architecture, I'll try and speed up a little bit. Um, the, um, this project is in Littlehampton, um, which is on the south coast of England. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely place to visit uh, with the kids for a day out, but it's a, it's a town which was, was quite deprived sort of uh, from, I guess, all of the tourists are going to Mallorca and not to Littlehampton. But it's sort of, um, so a, a client approached me, his first project after school, to, uh, after I finished school, to um, create a kind of low-cost, flexible um, uh, beach cafe on, on, in Littlehampton. Um, so what, how does this relate to sensory architecture? Well, we, I used motion and change, uh, and giving that kind of power to the building, it was able to open and close uh, like a plant. So the building has its own character, which changes through the seasons. It can adapt to like trade, um, but also, uh, there's a strong, a strong sense in the building of possibility, which is kind of offered to the people who visit there. So if you could imagine um, the sea spills inwards into the inside, and the inside spills outwards, kind of like water pouring between glasses. And that's, that's a kind of feeling that um, is, taken, is, give, is given to people there, and the possibility of, ex of enjoying the space is something people naturally, uh, naturally gain. So it sort of inspires action. Um, and um, an exploration. So this is a project which, I, which I'm, I'm not really allowed to show you, but I want to show you because it's new. <laughs> We've just completed, or just about to complete, this school playground in Chisenhale uh, School in, in Tower Hamlets. Um, and this was um, this is a school, it's not, not a particularly wealthy school, so, and they didn't have much space. So we, um, it's got sort of two parts to it. One is a hill, because the school had no kind of topography, and the hill, um, is trying to, well, I personally remember this, um, these tarmac mounds that I'd see as a child uh, next to roadworks. I'd go and want to go and lie on them because they're kind of warm, but you find out they're really sticky and hard. <laughs> so I wanted to create a soft one of those. Um, and also, um, this elevated room is kind of a place where anything can happen. And this is this sort of fine texture. It was about the kind of feeling of when you only run a feather across your upper lip, this sort of really fine sort of. Um, and which uh, I wanted the ch kids to be stimulated by. Um, so rather than being kind of a, a, a really prescriptive environment, it's a, it's a sort of it's more like a, a playing in a field where, where anything can happen. <laughs> Those are my kids, actually. Uh, so um, I, I, I like the idea that um, any creative instinct uh, can, can, can be, can, this building can materialize any of our creative instincts. I'm going to quickly show you two, two very fast films. Uh, this is a film, here we go. So um, this is a project we did this year in China on a street, and the only param the parameter was the street. There was no brief at all. And so 
I was sort of inspired by the idea of um, Chinese scrolls and how they have multiple viewpoints along a length. So, so designed this, um, this street sculpture which can be viewed from, changes its appearance, or in many ways, in appearance comes into form as you move along the street. Thank you. And um, this is a project we did um, last year uh, for something called the Light in Winter Festival uh, in Melbourne, in Federation Square. Um, and in this project, uh, each visitor to the square is sort of recorded as beams of light, which sort of orbit around the structure and then slowly diminish over time. So it's a, in a way, it's a sort of um, new way of thinking about making marks on the city. Um, and uh, it kind of relates to the project in Sochi in some way, but it's, um, it's maybe a little, little bit more poetic <laughs> in this effect. Um, okay, and, and finally, uh, we're, in, um, we're in Helsinki now, and this is the, uh, uh, our proposal for the Guggenheim Museum. Um, so this was the largest architecture competition in history, uh, 1,715 uh, entrants, and we got to the, the final six. Yay! <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't win. Boo! Oh, okay. So uh, we got close. There's lots to tell about the stories, which I won't go into. But basically, for me, it's a kind of city scale of senseware. Um, this is a, a, a um, very simplified architectural plan. It's a plan, if you imagine, sort of an onion made out of light. And this is this kind of gradient of light levels from the outside of the building uh, which people and sculpture like, and the center of the building, which uh, some types of art, two-dimensional art, really like darkness, so, um, or um, film, for example. So this became the kind of um, the way of plotting out the building, and we created that, that gradient by the use of a, um, a glass skin around the building, which has got a very fine texture on it, and it filters light through to create these different conditions. That's the building. At, at nighttime, it becomes a lantern, um, the Finnish people, local people, apparently really like the building. Um, and this is uh, the final slide. This is, um, this is the uh, building at sunrise. The building becomes the sunrise. So, um, okay, 20 seconds. Uh, the, um, I, just, I like the idea that the city can change by creating moments of kind of sensory... Um, awakening for its citizens and I kind of I'm very excited about the possibility of improving our city uh, in this way thank you